are you uh, good morning everybody uh, i'm sorry for the slight delay in starting we had some technical hitches but um, i think we will be all right now uh, why do we need to talk about a subject like visceral heterotaxy it is generally considered a difficult area to understand the purpose of this talk is to make you recognize that it is not particularly difficult and you will be able to make a diagnosis given the basic understanding of heterotaxy so what is it that we call visceral heterotaxy you know that cardiac malposition indicates that the heart is abnormally located within the chest you are familiar with situs inversus dextrocardia which is the mirror image of normal you know that situs solitus could have dextrocardia or situs inversus could have levocardia these are malformations that you are familiar with but some malformations have random organization of abdominal and thoracic viscera along with complex intracardiac abnormalities and this arrangement is called visceral heterotaxy in other words the words heteros means other and taxis means order or arrangement so this is the other arrangement the arrangement that is different from expected it is also been known in literature by terms like atrial isomerism right or left situs ambiguus or asplenia polysplenia syndromes so heterotaxy syndrome have a lateralization failure the body has failed to make a clear right left differentiation as a result there is an ambiguity in visceroatrial situs with some clues telling you that this is solitus some telling you that it is inversus and there are anomalies of systemic and pulmonary venous connections and there are complex intracardiac anomalies even though this might appear confusing there is a method in the madness and it is possible for you to predict what is going to happen and the confusion in the literature has related to differences in semantics between leading pathologists but if you as clinicians would consider heterotaxy as a syndrome of hafsard visceral arrangement which you can diagnose by appropriate imaging and associated with predictable clinical consequences it is just another disease it occurs one in 10000 lives like most cases we don't know the etiology and um, genetic mutations do occur in a small percentage there are multiple genes which are suspected which involves chromosomes like 12 13 6 20 and the x chromosome and mutation in sig3 in some cases and there are mouse models of visceral heterotaxy with genetics have evolved which have thrown light onto the molecular mechanisms underlying heterotaxy so we could look at heterotaxy as right isomerism left isomerism in most cases in a few instances it may be difficult to classify uh, so and then we will just call it visceral heterotaxy this discussion will presume that it is possible to make this classification in practically all the instances right isomerism is defined pathologically as having bilateral right atrial appendages you know that both the atrial appendages then would be broad and pyramidal lying close to each other but this is a pathologist definition clinicians would diagnose it when imaging shows juxtaposition of inferior vena cava and aorta in the abdomen with the ivc slightly anterior and thus crossing the aorta this is associated with asplenia i have tried to show this image towards the end of my talk because of the technical problems that we had uh, in this uh, ses session i have kept my videos towards the end of the talk so remember right isomerism 
you have to suspect echocardiographically when you find iota and IVC on the same side of the abdomen with the IVC slightly anterior and crossing the iota. Leave the appendages to the pathologist. This is a CT angiogram which shows a bilateral superior vena cava. It shows the uh, SVC on this side. This is the right SVC. This is the left SVC. A bilateral superior vena cava is a common thing in uh, right isomerism. And um, this is the abdominal, um, in the abdominal visceral disposition. It's a cartoon showing that. What you should see is this is the midline. Note that the iota and the IVC are both to the left of the midline. And um, the extracardiac anatomy is also abnormal. Both the lungs are trilobed and the bilateral arterial bronchi. Uh, we will show this uh, better as we go along. The liver is transverse. Stomach is on the same side as liver. There is a splenia and there is gut malrotation. There is a short mesentery and there is predisposition to volvulus. What you should realize is that whereas a full-blown case of right isomerism in the pathologic sense would have all these along with the right juxtaposition of the atrial appendages, in the given clinical case, you will find a combination of one or few. You may not find all of them and it's not necessary to establish the diagnosis. Look at the bronchial anatomy. In the normal bronchial anatomy, the right bronchus is arterial. I'm sorry for that. It is above the pulmonary artery. The right bronchus is above the pulmonary artery and it of course has three branches. While the left bronchus, it is clearly below the left pulmonary artery. So you call it hypartereal. So the right bronchus is arterial. The left bronchus is hypartereal. And what happens in right isomerism? Both the bronchi are epartereal and there are three branches. And what happens to the systemic veins? Inferior vena cava and abdominal iota, we said, run along the same side of the spine. The hepatic veins may join the inferior vena cava, but on the other hand, the right and left hepatic veins may enter the ipsilateral side of the common atrium. The coronary sinus is usually absent. Superior vena cava is usually bilateral, as we have shown in the previous CT image. This is a CT image that shows IVC and iota on the same side of the spine. IVC here and descending iota here on the same side of the spine. And um, if you say seeing a cross-sectional view, you'll find that they are both on the same side, one in front of the other, IVC being in front. And uh, this is what I referred with regard to the hepatic veins. You would normally expect the hepatic veins to join the inferior vena cava either separately or through a common trunk. In the case of right isomerism, they join the atria separately. Uh, they may join the atria separately. This is the right sided hepatic veins join the right corner of the common atrium and the left sided veins joining the left corner, corner of the common atrium. And what happens to the pulmonary veins? They are frequently anomalous. And supracardiac TAPVC with a vertical vein onto the either side is common. Infracardiac is quite uncommon in this but has been reported. Uh, this is a, an atypical variant of a pulmonary venous connection in um, uh, right isomerism. In this case, you are finding the right pulmonary veins joining the, the SVC. In fact, the right lower lobe vein is joining the SVCRA junction. And the intracardiac anatomy, the atrial septum and the AV canal, if you see, it's a common AV canal and corner malformations are common. So it's an unbalanced common AV canal with some form of outflow obstruction that is classical of right isomerism. 
So the ventricles may be either loop, either ventricle may be hypoplastic, but more often it is a morphologic LV that is hypoplastic. And the ventricular outflow tract, pulmonary outflow tract obstruction is invariable. There is stenosis or atresia. And uh, both great vessels generally tend to come out to the right ventricle. Therefore, an unbalanced AV canal with DORV and pulmonary stenosis or atresia is the classical feature of right isomerism. So the caveats are, if a child has unbalanced AV canal, pulmonary atresia or PS, and you are finding supracardiac TAPVC, take it for granted this child has right isomerism. Look for it. Right isomerism will not have conditions amenable to two ventricle repair. It will not have conditions associated with an increase in the pulmonary blood flow. So it is always a decreased pulmonary blood flow. Of course, there could be map cards, that's a different story. But basically, it is a pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia that is the invariable outflow component of right isomerism. Now moving to left, pathologically, it is having two left atrial appendages. Both the atrial appendages are finger-like and small. It's associated with polysplenia. And clinicians would diagnose it when they find interrupted inferior vena cava with asagus or hemiasagus drainage. So if you see here, this is iota and this is IVC. The IVC is interrupted in the infrarenal segment. From here, continuation is by the asagus vein. All that you would see while you are imaging is one single venous channel which is going upward, which does not enter the heart, but bypasses the heart and enters the superior vena cava. If it's on the right side, you call it asigus. If it's on the left side, you call it hemiasigus continuation. And uh, extracardiac anomalies show the bilateral left-sidedness. You find both lungs bilobed. You have bilateral hyparterial bronchi, polysplenia, midline liver, gut malrotation. So unlike asplenia in the right isomerism, here there is polysplenia. And the bronchial anatomy, just recalling the normal bronchial anatomy, remember normally the left bronchus is hyparterial. And in left isomerism, both bronchi are hyparterial. They are long and they have two branches. So in right isomerism, you have both bronchi which are aparterial. In left isomerism, you have both bronchi which are hyparterial. And the uh, inferior vena cava is interrupted, the suprarenal segment being absent as we discussed. And the IVC continues as the asigus or the hemiasigus vein to join the superior vena cava on the same side. And what the imaging would show is a venous structure running upwards on the same side of the iota posterior to it. And hepatic veins would drain into the systemic venous atrium. This may be one common vein. There may be two common veins or the veins may drain separately. And superior vena cava, are, it is frequently bilateral. So this is what an interrupted IVC would uh, look like. The IVC seems to continue upward. What is important is that it does not join the heart. It goes and joins the superior vena cava. This tells you that it has to be an asigus or hemiasigus continuation. And in abdominal CT, you find this abnormal vessel in relation to the iota. And uh, uh, this image will not move, so I'll show this later. This shows the way the hepatic veins would join. Remember, uh, when IVC is interrupted, hepatic veins are orphaned. They have to leave, go somewhere, and they join the right atrium directly. Pulmonary veins, partial anomalous drainage is common. What happens is that the pulmonary veins drain to ipsilateral atria, which means the right-sided pulmonary veins are going to the right uh, side of the atrium and the left-sided pulmonary veins to the left side. This is uh, what is meant by that. In the CT image, here is the common atrial mass. Here are the right-sided pulmonary veins. You can see that they are joining the right corner. while 
the left sided pulmonary veins are joining the left corner. So we say that they are joining the ipsilateral atria. And intracardiac anatomy, we said the left appendages are bilateral and uh, the sinus node is absent. As a result, the rhythm would be affected. It would be either a junctional rhythm or less commonly complete heart block. It's a common atrium, co which is the common abnormality. The AV valves may be common. There may be an isolated cleft in the mitral valve. Remember, they could be completely normal also. Ventricles could have a D loop or an L loop. The outflow tract may be unobstructed, unlike right isomerism, where it's very unlikely to have an unobstructed outflow. In left isomerism, you could have an unobstructed outflow and increased pulmonary flow also. Both supplementary stenosis and subaortic stenosis do occur. And the great arterial relationship may be double outlet right ventricle. So the important point here is that one, a left isomerism heart could be otherwise normal. Two, it could have a simple lesion. Three, it could also have a complex lesion. Four, unlike right isomerism, it could have a lesion with an increase in the pulmonary blood flow. Van Pra has this interesting hypothesis regarding the pathogenesis or the embryogenesis of atrial isomerism. He points out that the Atrial appendage in the fetus would grow if only there is adequate filling of the right atrium. Normally, the fetal circulation promotes filling of the right atrium with everything coming into the right atrium. So the right atrial appendage grows and is a prominent structure. We call it broad and triangular. Whereas the left atrium has hardly any flow other than what is coming in through the PFO. The pulmonary venous return you know in the fetus is very little. And therefore, the LA appendage remains underdeveloped as small and finger-like, while the RA appendage is broad and pyramidal. In right isomerism, given bilateral SVC, not only the RA appendage, but the LA appendage is also better filled and stimulated to grow. Hence, both grow and both resemble right. In left isomerism, with an interrupted IVC, Flow is similarly affected on both sides and therefore you find that both the appendages do not grow and they remain small, finger-like and therefore both resemble left appendages. So he relates the formation of the atrial appendages to the venous flow into the atria and thus explains how right isomerism and left isomerism happens. So what are the caveats with regard to left isomerism? Conditions amenable to two ventricle repair, simple lesions with increased pulmonary blood flow like atrial septal defect, secondum, ventricular septal defect, conventional, tetralogy, all these can occur or a single atrium can occur. But you can also have complex lesions like a univentricular heart and pulmonary atresia. So now let's look at the clinical features. In uh, left isomerism, the heart disease may be mild and nearly two-thirds may have lesions amenable to biventricular repair and a third have complex single ventricles. Bradycardia due to junctional rhythm or complete heart block is common. If we look at the ECG, in right isomerism, the P axis may be normal, it may be inverted or it may be alternating between the two because there is commonly two sinus nodes, one on the right side, one on the left side. And the rhythm could alternate between the two, giving you the appearance of atrial solitus in one ECG and atrial inversion in an ECG taken on another occasion. RVH is common. LVH or biventricular hypertrophy may also be present. But QRS axis may be either right or left. It's more often in the right upper quadrant. And in left isomerism, the P waves are inverted in inferior leads, suggesting a coronary sinus rhythm. Complete heart block may occur in 10%. QRS axis is frequently left, and either ventricle may be hypertrophic. This is a right isomerism ECG. What you would see here, look at the atrial inversion. The P is inverted in lead 1 and upright in AVR. So this would suggest an atrial inversion and the RV is dominant.
In left isomerism, as you can see, look at the P waves in 2, 3 and AVF, they are inverted, suggesting a junctional or coronary sinus rhythm, which is very characteristic of left isomerism. If you look at the X-ray, it's uh, the transverse liver and the abnormal position of the gastric gas bubble, which would give you the clue that this is a heterotaxy. And a penetrated view would often show the bronchial anatomy. Cardiac malposition, often mesocardia, may be noted. You could have any position for the heart. If you see this X-ray, you can note that here the bronchi are marked, but that's difficult to see. Look at the gastric gas bubble. That is on the right side. And the liver also appears to be on the right side. This type of um, uh, what you do not expect, that is very characteristic of heterotaxy. And um, the characteristic finding in the peripheral smear for asplenia is to have hovel jolly bodies, which are nuclear remnants. You will find this rather bluish staining uh, particles within the red cells, which are remnants of the nuclei. Haynes bodies may also be seen, that denatured hemoglobin seen in the red cells. When you do an echo, the assessment of the abdominal situs should give you the clue to isomerism. Don't miss it at that level. Therefore, when you see that um, the iota and IVC are on the same side, or when you see that the IVC is interrupted, that is when you have made a basic diagnosis of uh, heterotaxy, and from there onwards, it is a segmental localization to assess the actual anatomic lesions. Even though we say that the atrial situs is ambiguous, often it is possible to assess the atrial situs correctly. So when possible, you should ascertain that, and conceding that at times it is impossible. And assess the cardiac lesion as you would do in any case. And in a right isomerism, always suspect TAPVC and go after it. You have to establish pulmonary venous drainage beyond any doubt, and then only accept it. A CT or MR angio is extremely useful. The advantage, it shows the complete visceral arrangement, not only the cardiac anatomy, you are interested in the uh, chest and abdominal anatomy and the venous connections. That makes the complete diagnosis of heterotaxy. Uh, in this image of left isomerism, you can see that the IVC is interrupted and the hepatic veins are joining the atrium directly. And there is bilateral SVC. This is to show polysplenia on uh, top of the kidney on this side. You find multiple um, shadows of spleen. And um, this is um, an, in, sorry, an image showing the iota on the right side and the IVC on the left side. And uh, this is the classic bronchial appearance. See the bronchi? the right and the left, both under the pulmonary artery. So we say that both bronchi are hyperarterial, and therefore that is left isomerism. And in right isomerism, see that the bronchi, this is the advantage of CT. See both the bronchi clearly shown above the pulmonary artery. So both are aparterial. And this image of left isomerism, uh, the volume rendered reconstructed image showing the IVC continuing as the acetagus and joining the I'm sorry for that and joining the superior vena cava on this side. In many cases today you can make the diagnosis antenatally. When you see a when you are doing a fetal echo, if you find an abnormal situs with a complex cardiac lesion, suspect that this may be heterotaxy. Or you find bradycardia and an abnormal situs, suspect that this may be heterotaxy. You find bradycardia with high drops, there is a query because any uh, complete heart block at a slow rate could lead to high drops. But still, in that setting, you should be suspecting a heterotaxy also. And generally, fetal diagnosis is associated with a dismal prognosis. This is one instance where you can uh, see the, com the complete heart block or the, uh, the, you can find that the atrial rate is faster 
the ventricular rate is slower in a simultaneous tracing from the atrial and the ventricular wall. And uh, you also find the iota and the acegus vein on the same side. So how do you deal with uh, these babies? If a neonate has single ventricle pulmonary atresia and TAPVC, uh, it's doubtful whether you should offer treatment. You need to discuss with the family that the outcome of these babies is not great and in many centers they are given only compassionate care. In the absence of TAPVC, a single ventricle PS can be managed in the usual way. You could do a BT shunt for a hypoxic neonit. If the baby has reasonable saturation, leave it alone in the neonatal period and you can do a stage spontane operation later. And with left isomerism, remember, you may have lesions which are amenable to biventricular repair. And in right isomerism, the asplenia confers a lifelong risk of infection with capsulated bacteria. So you need to give antibiotic prophylaxis on a daily basis. This could be amoxicillin, 10 mg per kg per day in infants in the first, in children below the first five years. And this could be substituted with oral penicillin later. Pneumococcal and hemophilus influenza vaccines are indicated in right isomerism infants. So the prognosis is worst for the fetus with left isomerism and complete heart block. For the newborn with right isomerism, single ventricle pulmonary atresia and obstructed TAPVC. And some series have reported fundan results similar to non-isomeric subjects when the high-risk neonates are excluded. This is a paper that we had published this year uh, where we had found in India the presentation is of course at a later rate compared to what is reported in literature mainly because the critically ill small babies die and the median age of presentation of right isomerism is still little lower than the left. And uh, congestive heart failure is more likely to occur in left isomerism. And cyanosis is more likely to occur in right isomerism than in left isomerism. And um, various anatomic features, bilateral SVC uh, in our series was slightly more common in left than in right isomerism. That's not the literature report. Uh, TAPVC is, of course, overwhelmingly common in right isomerism. Uh, other findings like um, having two ventricles, in the case of what is shown here as 10, it only shows that there were two demonstrable ventricles, but um, none of them would have a, a two ventricle repair. This shows the distribution of the various abnormalities. And the outcome as we see um, in India is illustrated here. If you are looking at left isomerism, out of 31 cases, 26 were operated and 5 were unoperated because of the complexity of the lesion. And um, in right isomerism, on the other hand, 12 were unoperated and 20 were operated. And in right isomerism, the surgery is all uh, in the Fontan tract, BDG uh, plus minus Fontan later, and TAPVC repair when it is possible to do that. In the case of left isomerism, you could have a more extensive range of surgery, which includes uh, biventricular, which in uh, 26 cases, 11 had biventricular repair, and, uh, and 15 had univentricular repair. And the biventricular repair comes across the full range of cardiac anatomy. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, I would also just show some of the videos which I wanted to show as part of the presentation. I would like a response from you to know whether you can actually see the videos moving. Can somebody respond? Are you actually seeing the videos moving? Can somebody tell me? Are the videos moving? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Vinakshi. So that means I'll continue to play them. What this shows, say, is when you are beginning to do the, the echo in the abdomen, you are finding both iota and IVC. If you see, you can see iota and IVC both and finally when it freezes, they are on the same side. What this shows is iota and IVC crossing and then they are on the same side when you see the frozen image. So this is the point at which you should suspect right isomerism. And the I'll take questions after I have uh, shown this. And this is the characteristic lesion. I hope you can see this. It's a complete AV canal defect. You can see that um, there's a large primer maze. It's a common AV valve, and you don't see the ventricular septum. So it's a single ventricle. Note that there's a primer maze and a uh, AV canal type of single ventricle. So it's an unbalanced AV canal. The left sided ventricle is hypoplastic. And this lesion is very characteristic of right isomerism, particularly when you have shown the next. Here you find the same thing with color because very often there is significant AV valve regurgitation in these children, which is an independent. Uh, predictor of adverse prognosis after, because for a univentricular repair AV valve regurgitation is not a good substrate. Here you find that there is only one vessel which is leaving the heart which is the iota. The pulmonary artery is satritic. You can see that in the lower part the pulmonary artery is not seen at all posterior to the iota until you see quite lower down because this is supplied by ductus as you will see in the next image. The same image with the uh, color flow, you can see that ductal flow is coming into confluent pulmonary artery but uh, it is a seagull, the pulmonary, main pulmonary artery is completely atritic. So this uh, type of single ventricle, which is an unbalanced AV canal and pulmonary atresia, makes it a very characteristic lesion of right isomerism. In this setting, you should be looking aggressively for pulmonary venous connection. In this particular patient, it was normal. But if the pulmonary venous connection uh, is to be accepted as normal, you should be very, very convinced that it is normal. Otherwise, you could be missing a TAPVC. I think that's all. Now I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, please remember what we have tried to do is to give the message that visceral heterotaxy has a clear clinical background. You can always um, make a diagnosis of it and the diagnosis is made once the echocardiographic imaging is done. You are not looking at the atrial appendages for clinical diagnosis. Based on the echocardiographic imaging, you can make a diagnosis of atrial isomerism. You can look for lesions which are characteristic. And since the association is so striking, if you miss the right isomerism, if you found a characteristic lesion like a single ventricle pulmonary atresia and TAPVC, you can go back and recheck on the situs as well. Thank you. Any questions? Since everybody is sending in their thanks, does it mean that there are no questions?
Any question? Okay, then let's conclude the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. I will send the session. Okay. Yes. Kunika, you could hear well? Yes, I was hearing it well. Ah. It and the nice. videos finally moved? Yes, the videos were moving. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Kunika. And I'm signing off. Okay. Yes.